find strength to help us out. Sing a new song, these hymns this
everybody. It is good to see you here on Sunday night. There are many other places you could be, I am sure of that, but I am glad you're here. And aren't you glad that the Spirit of the Lord is here? Now, we could be like a lot of churches, that there's no move of the Spirit, and there's no move of the Lord. Now, decency and and everything being in order is what is required. But truly, if we're God's church, and I know it's so hard because we live in America and we live in a time crunch, and, and I know probably many of you are already probably thinking about 6 a.m. alarm clocks or 5 a.m. alarm clocks and working all day tomorrow, and I understand that. But if we're God's church, we need to be led by the Spirit that it doesn't matter what, if it messes up my personal schedule, but it's what the Lord wants on a Sunday night. Can, can we be that type of a church in San Diego? In the middle of America, when everything is about me and my way and my schedule and my time, are there still a hundred people? Is there still 50 people that say, it's about God's spirit. It's about God's way. It's about us operating together in the oneness of God. How many victorious people are here? How many of you feel good in the spirit? How many people are in the middle of a battle, but you know that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world? Come on, you're in the middle of a struggle, but I know that you will be victorious. Somebody put your hands together. I might be in the middle of a battle, but I am victorious. You can be in the middle of a financial struggle, but you know what? You're going to be victorious. You might be in the middle of a marriage mess up, but you can be victorious. I promise you. I promise you. I know I didn't give you this scripture. As I talk, if you go to Isaiah 61, man, I love being a part of the Anchor family. I love being here with you guys. Great worship, we could pack it up and go home. But by the foolishness of preaching. So that's what we're gonna do. And I know there's no clock back there. Brother Franklin broke it for me. So it's messing me up. What I tend to do when I don't have a clock is not go longer. I go, do you, I speak faster. Does anybody? So you like, my brain keeps thinking, oh Lord, it's seven o'clock. We got to get everybody home. We got to get everybody home. So I'm going to do my best to slow down without a clock. (laughs) I can't quite see that one. But I I know you're pointing to it, Frank, but I can't quite see the other one. Isaiah 61 and 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise, for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. 
Pray with me all together, every one of us. Lord, it's Sunday night, and we dedicate this day, this is Sabbath, unto you. And we want to be your people. We want to be Isaiah 61 people. God, that through us, you're going to open doors and set prisoners free. And you're going to give joy for mourning. That you're going to take, give beauty for ashes. That you're going to help us, Lord, to put on a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. We can trade these things in together as a church body, Lord. Use me, use us together as a family to operate in the gifts of the Spirit tonight. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Have you ever, I know nobody in here has ever seen any of this stuff, but have you ever seen any shows on Hulu when people get like those extreme wardrobe makeovers? And they get, or yeah, I remember as a kid watching, uh, my mom would, and would watch Oprah and, I'm not a big Oprah fan. I can't remember the last time. But you remember when they would go into like the ghetto and they'd get these people and they'd give them, take them and get them all this clothes and get them all made up. And, and I would think, man, why can't they come to this little town in Stacy and, and give, give Mark Waddle a little makeover, this little chubby 5, 280 pound kid in sixth grade? Because it just, when they put all those new clothes on them, it just made them, they seemed so happy. And the, and the mom would cry, or the, or the kid would cry, and oh, it changed their life, maybe, in their moment, or it changed it temporarily. But sometimes, in our everyday lives, we forget that we have the choice of what wardrobe we wear. Let me step back for a second. We're, we're a church that is, in the next age in the next 10 years we're going to, have to be a church that takes some risks we have to take our hands off the steering wheel we can't always do church the way we've always done church or we're never ever going to reach the people that God wants us to reach and I'm talking to myself. I'm not saying we're, I, by no means am I saying we're not going to teach truth and we're not going to teach the oneness and holiness and separation. But I'm saying there are millions of people, uh, I, even in San Diego, hundreds of thousands of people that if the trumpet sounded, we would not have reached them with the gospel. We got to get out of our comfort zone. We got to get off our agenda, our plan. It has always been and always will be God's world, God's plan, God's Bible, and God's heaven. We got to get out ourselves out of our world, and we need to get in his world so we can let him operate in our churches, and not just on Sunday, but God wants to operate in our lives on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. But if we want to be an Isaiah 61 church, we got to let God's spirit mess us up. And I, I'm going back now a little bit. I remember as a kid, do you remember when people would come to the altars and the pastors would lay hands on them and, and mess their hair up and they'd sweat and they'd fall out? Well, I'm not, and I'm, part of me is saying we need to get back to that hunger of revival that we had in the 60s and 70s. Where is this generation, this Joshua generation that says, oh, it doesn't matter what are we going to do, revival. It doesn't matter my schedule, my money, my retirement Lord, but it's you. One thing on our mind, what is the Spirit wanting to do right now? Right now. How do we become in Isaiah 61 church? Good question. Thank you for asking. Become an Isaiah 61 church. What are you wearing today? What am I wearing? I know it's very hard when you do something that becomes tradition or becomes something we do three times a week, becomes a habit, right? We want church to become a habit. We want the disciplines to become a habit. But yet, how do we create habit but not create a culture of just it's normal, it's boredom, it's the way things always are? We're always going to th sing three songs, but Larson's always going to get up and sing, I lean on you, Lord. If you're in the, in the team here, Brother Larson will always mess up the Sunday schedule. It will always happen. Something will go wrong in our schedule that we pass out, that we try to keep everybody on the same page. But, that, but it becomes normal. 
We're going to talk about the anointing first. If we lose the anointing, we should shut the doors. Close shop. There are some churches that if the spirit left, they would never realize it. We can never become that type of church that is so regimented and so strict and everything's down to the minute that we somehow lose the anointing of God. We need to be the type of church that if the anointing's not moving on Sunday, Brother Walkstead or Brother Larson walks up to this platform as the pastor and say, you know what? Something's wrong. Something's missing. We need to collectively get on our knees. We need to collectively lift our hands and begin to worship the Lord. Because if we lose the anointing, folks, we've lost it all. Because the anointing is the liberator. The anointing breaks the yoke. Somebody put your hands together. We want to give our best as musicians and best as the choir and and sing and study and and know the word of God. But there is something to be said about getting on an altar and getting an old-fashioned anointing that breaks the chains and breaks the yoke and still sets people free. Let's do something because we cannot have a church without the spirit of God. The anointing is a sacred or solemn unction. Anointed, you're authorized, you're set apart. It's our desire to be anointed, not just so we know that God's here, but we want to be anointed so we can be in Isaiah 61 church. We want the anointing because we live in a crazy world. Have you driven down the street? Have you driven to your neighbor's house? We live in a very different society than we did in 1990. The government is struggling because it's not a United States government or a U.S. and Europe, but it is a world government. Europe stock market. Last week, got a phone call from my dad. Oh, man, the European stock market's going down. It's going to affect my... Ret- my grandpa has never worried about the economy in Europe. But guess what? If China goes down, you ain't going to be able to buy anything at Walmart. Target and Walmart will close. Everything, we depend on everybody. We live in an ever-changing, quickly-changing society. Just when you think you might have this figured out, it's all going to change. How many of you grew up with cell phones? Okay, the front row. (laughs) How many of you remember? I remember this. We had our our cool kitchen phone that would stretch it out because you want to talk to a girl and you don't want your mom to hear. So the kitchen kitchen phone could, could literally go out the other room, shut the door, and you could still talk. You don't have to worry. My mom did not worry about me texting anybody at midnight. The only thing she worried about at midnight is if my rear end was in bed and I wasn't eating. (laughs) But we're saturated with negativity in this world. Pick up the newspaper, turn on the radio, everything. I I get on my email, and if you're like my email, the first thing that comes up on my email is all the news. Man, before I can even check all my discouraging email, I get discouraged by the news. But we have a good word and we have good news in this day and this age. We have a good message, but we got to package our message with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. It can't be about what happens inside these four walls. Church is not what happens here on Sunday from 10 to noon. Church is how you live on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Sin is still important. Sin is still an issue in our society. In our society, they want to say that, well, you you do what makes you feel good, and you do what you feel good, and I'm going to live the way I want to live. They want to tell you that there's little truth, little truth, that there's no big capital T that says that there is a certain way, and there is a right and a wrong, and there is a heaven and a hell. No, no, no. You can live the way you want. 
I'll live the way I want, and we'll all float away together. No, there is still sin. There is still things that are wrong. There are still things that will separate you from Christ. There are things that separate you from his power and his anointing. It is sin. Don't compromise with the devil for your besetting sin. No, get under the anointing of the Holy Ghost in a Pentecostal service and let that anointing break that sin in your life. I still believe that God's power can set people free. I still believe that when somebody receives the Holy Ghost, they can go home and not be addicted to alcohol. I believe they don't have to pick up another cigarette. Why? Because I still believe that there is an anointing inside of this building that comes from heaven. There is a power that goes back thousands of years to a cross that came out, but God came out from that grave. And if he can come out of that grave, baby, me and you can be overcomers. Let me tell you, I tell you what the anointing is. It is a liberator. The anointing is what sets us free. It is a freedom giver. Every one of us have been burnt out, have been discouraged, have been run down. We've all been there. You can look back in your life. But remember that out of those ashes that God made something beautiful. Do you remember when you were lost and you were an alcoholic? Do you remember when you were lost and you were drinking or you were sleeping around? But look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Not through what me and you have done, but through what he can do. There are people, let me explain, and I, I, uh, it's sad to say, but we see this a lot in church. There are people that wear a spirit of heaviness. The spirit of heaviness has to do with despondency. The spirit of heaviness has to do with depression or oppression. It is one of the oldest tricks of the enemy. <laughs> the biggest pitfall in our world. This spirit drives people to alcohol, drugs, addicted to prescribed drugs. It is a spirit of heaviness. There are people that wear a spirit of heaviness. They come in to God's presence and they leave the same way they came in. They leave with the same clothes on. They leave with the same attitude. They leave with the same gossiping spirit. They leave with the same critical spirit. And here they grew up in church. They grew up in the presence. This is what I'm talking about, what happens when you're raised in church. And I can say that because I am fourth generation. We get so used to everything. If the music's not right or if the preacher goes long or he's too loud, too short, too fat, we criticize everything. But where is the spirit of praise that is supposed to be on God's church? I speak to everyone who has been buried in the name of Jesus. Because when you went down in that watery grave, you did not come up and put on the name of Mark Waddle. But when you went down in the watery grave, you put on the name that is given among every name whereby you must be saved. You! When you got the Holy Ghost, there was a power that was put inside of you that's made you not a critical, judgmental, but it is a spirit of freedom, liberty, love, mercy. <laughs> when you went in that grave, some theologians want to tell me and you that when we're baptized, it's just what we do to make ourselves feel good. No, no, no. When you were buried in the name of Jesus, it was a watery grave. I take the Bible literally, and you went in that watery grave, and that preacher here or another church said, in the name, we bury you, we baptize you in the name of Jesus. When you came out of that watery grave, you left your old self behind. So come out, out of the grave, just like Jesus. You come out, and you are new. You are set free. You are liberated. I just wish you believed it. I just wish that you knew that you were saved. Let me explain. I know 
Maybe you don't like the song. They sang. And so we kind of just... Let me come to that in a minute. I'm going to hurt somebody's feelings. Let me explain. Now, there are seasons of heaviness. But it should never be a spirit of heaviness. You lose a loved one. You, some, you go through a, a tragic situation. Not every Sunday are you going to run the aisles. For some of you, any Sunday you come to the altar will be really good. <laughs> but what happens is we let a temporary heaviness turn into a spirit of heaviness. You can cash in your spirit of heaviness for praise. Now, and I, let, me, let me tell you this in parentheses. Or I'm not asking anybody to run, jump, nothing, nothing, nothing today. I'm not. But I am going to talk to you about praise because it's biblical. I'm going to talk to you. You can cash in your discouragement. You can cash in your disappointments. You can cash in your failed past marriages that messed up. And okay, you can cash that in for a spirit of praise. A spirit of heaviness isn't from God. You don't have to accept the spirit of heaviness. There are people who are so used to their depressed attitude, their depressed outlook, their oppressed. They're so used to it that they don't ever change their clothes. Let me explain. This morning, even though I'm married, I still had the choice to get up and pick out my outfit. And I went to her, and I said, this actually right here, right here, I said, babe, is this okay for Sunday night to preach? And she said, yeah, 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 oh, that looks good. Okay, okay. So I, had, I somewhat had the choice. And we have a choice how we come to church and how we leave. Children of God are not controlled by circumstances. Our outlook is based on Jesus Christ. Your current situation does not determine your destination. Your current situation does not determine your destination. Your current situation does not determine your worth and who you are. No, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I know that the King Jesus is with me. I want to tell you it pays to praise God, like when you feel like it or when you don't feel like it. Let me tell you, you choose your coat. This morning you can get up <laughs> and you choose what you put on. And you went home, you watched the Chargers lose, you came back with a depressed attitude. But you can go home with a better attitude because we choose what coat we wear. You don't believe me, but you choose it. You can choose to come in here and praise the Lord and worship God and for all that he is, or you can choose to believe in your spirit of heaviness. But I choose a spirit of praise. I choose a spirit of joy. I'm trading in my ashes for beauty. I'm trading in my depressed spirit for the joy of the Lord is in me. I'm trading in my broke wallet for all the riches of heaven. Somebody help me praise the Lord. Come on, I give you permission for 30 seconds to worship him with all you got. You haven't been, you have not been assigned depression. Put on your praise. Put on your worship. Come on, some of you need to physically take off your depressed attitude. Take off your old self and put on some praise.
You may be seated. There's a lot of power in a positive attitude. Let me talk about this for a few seconds. I'm not talking about God and the supernatural right now. I'm not talking about the divine. I'm talking about life. If I have to choose to be around me all the time, a positive atheist or a negative, depressed, Pentecostal, I'm going to choose the atheist. Because sometimes we have some people in Pentecost that looks like they sucked 14 pickles. <laughs> Cranky. But give me a positive attitude. Give me a positive outlook with the faith of Jesus Christ. It's not I can do good and I can meditate well and I can, I can think good thoughts, but it's I can do all things through Christ who strength. I can't see my way out of where I am, but I can do all things through Christ. I'm at the bottom of the barrel, Lord. I'm looking up at the belly of a snake, but I can do all things through Christ. We, I do believe this, we are one simple thing away from the dimension where God wants us to be in San Diego in 2011. The one thing that separates us as this church from any other church, we might even sing the same songs. We might have preach similar messages, but it is the anointing, it's the anointing tagged up with our praise. I'm telling you, you can go to some charismatic fluff church where gold comes out of the ceiling, but that is not the anointing or the power of God. But we are not, we are not tapped in yet to where God wants us to be, but we are going to get there through our praise. Now, I'm not prayer and fasting. Those are very necessary. But I'm going to show you here examples from the Bible where it is going to be our praise. Does anybody remember the story of Jehoshaphat? Just when he thought everything was great, there were some armies. Whew. They began to come on him. You know, there's stages of life. There's some crazy stages of life. Sometimes you're being squeezed. Sometimes it's release. Sometimes you're squeezed. Jehoshaphat found him in a tough situation. He knew there was an enemy in front of him and that the enemy was coming. He knew he didn't stand a chance. Jehoshaphat had an emergency. You ever call somebody and, and you have an emergency? And they're like, uh-huh. Ooh, okay. You have a good day now. The difference between an emergency... <laughs> And a problem is, it's a problem when you're dealing with it. It's an emergency when I'm dealing with it. When it's in my family. So what was happening to Jehoshaphat? He knew he was in big trouble. The Bible says he prayed and fasted. And he still didn't get an answer. Man. Anybody been there? I don't know where we're going. I don't know what we're going to do. God didn't answer my prayer. Psalms 121, I will lift up mine eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from Pastor Larson. My help comes from Pastor Walkstetter. My help comes from my brothers and sisters. No. You see, he tapped into a different realm. He tapped into another place. He said, there's no need to look at my army. There's no need to look at how strong my men are. There's no need to look at these things. And my bank account, he knew he was empty. He didn't have enough. But he said, I looked onto the hills from which cometh. The problem is many times we don't look high enough.
We don't get our gaze onto him. We, we, it's so hard when you're in the middle of the woods to see out to see the sun. But if you can somehow get above the trees of your problems and the trees of your situation, and you can look up, the more you see him and how powerful the Lord is and how great his army is, you realize it doesn't matter how little we have. It doesn't matter what situation we're in because my God, your God, our our God is greater, is greater. So listen, listen. He humbled himself and prayed and fasted. The entire nation prayed and fasted. They knew everybody was going to die. The word comes back from God and says, you're not going to have to fight this battle, for the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. Some battles are ours. Some battles are his. Why do we sometimes try to out God, God? It's like, well, I think I know how to fix this situation at work. I know how to fix this. And you begin, you get all, ra you know, I, you're like thinking, Man, the fin I know financial times are tough, and it's hard on everybody. And, and let me tell you, you're thinking, man, if I start working 60 hours a week, and if I start I keep working 70 hours a week, and if I, I do this, and, I'm not, and if I start working on Sundays, they're going to pay. You know what? Let God fight your battle. I was on the phone this week. Somebody's been laid off a year and a half, and I began, or two weeks ago, I don't want to don't fabricate. Two weeks ago, I was on the phone with somebody, and I was talking to her, and we've been praying and praying and, and praying for her to get a job. She's been laid off. And you know what? It's not a great job. It's not a great paying thing. It's not even permanent. But for the next eight weeks, she's making 25 bucks an hour, and she's getting 40 hours a week. What am I talking about? There's something about looking to your Savior, looking past your situation and saying, here, Lord, that you're giving me eight weeks of pay. I'm going to take it. I'm going to run with it. You can, we want to out-God him, though. We're like, I'm going to move over here. I'm going to move over here. But Jehoshaphat began to worship. Then he's told to have all the people praise him, to appoint singers and worshipers to go before the warriors. And then they were to praise the Lord. And the Bible says that when they begin to sing and praise the Lord, that he set an ambushment against his enemy. No one can ambush your enemies like the Lord. <laughs> Nobody can fix a situation like the Lord. So why do we try to fix it? We need to turn it over to him. Our job is not to fight the battle. Our job is to praise and worship and glorify the Lord. God is not some long-haired Santa and 450 pounds and in a wheelchair. My God is strong and mighty, and he hears all things. He sees all things, and he will work for us. God's not bankrupt. So the battle was won by praise. What would happen tonight if our whole church everybody here really praised the Lord I don't mean 10% I don't mean the youth group because they got young legs and I'm not talking about anybody but I'm saying you know it's like even me sometimes I'm like oh let the kids jump and praise a hundred percent a building full of people seeking the Lord. Look, look, we want to, I want to be like Jesus. And when they laid, this isn't about Jesus, but another story here. And when they laid many stripes on him, they cast him into prison, charged the jailer to keep him safely. Who have receiving such a charge thrust them into the innermost prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. You know the story. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto the God, and the prisoners heard them. Now, I, I've heard so many, you know, they began to shake their chains, and 
Okay, I'm not, I don't, I wasn't there. And the Bible doesn't say they sang praise him, praise him. Okay, they begin to praise the Lord. I don't think they had drums, an organ, a sound system. They didn't come into church dependent on the choir to lead them into praise. They had been beat up, beat to death, thrown in a prison, and they were chained up. And in their midnight hour, they just began to praise the Lord. I, I, I'm not as smart as Brother Walkstetter, but Brother Walkstetter, maybe, what do you think the Greek means when it says praise the Lord? I think it means praise the Lord. Well, well Brother Walkstetter, what do you think the Greek means? They were in chains. They had been beat. Okay, where's Mark Waddle's story in Acts? Okay, over here, bef right before they killed and stoned, and Mark Waddle led music in San Diego. None of us would read that. Well, his life wasn't very exciting. But we want to... God, but I want to be you. But I, I don't know how to praise you in my darkest hour. Want to be like Jesus? Don't forget they killed him. We're in something that is all-consuming. We're in something that is still worth our all in all. Still worth everything. They were chained up. They were set free while they prayed. No. The jail didn't break as they did yoga. It didn't happen as they meditated on the wise words of a man. No. It happened when they praised. It happened when they praised. Not just a little bit, but until other people that were bound were set free. That's why it's so important if you're a praiser and everyone, before I'm a preacher, before I'm a music director, before I'm anything or work a job or before I'm a husband or someday a, a father or before I'm a grand, I am called out of this world to be a praiser, to be a worshiper of Jesus Christ. You don't need to have a theology degree to look in the Bible and say, and they praised him and they were set free. If I have breath in my body, I ought to praise him. If I have hands, I ought to praise him. If I got a sound mind, I ought to praise him. I got two feet, I ought to praise him. I got a beautiful wife, I got a great family, I live in a great city, I live in a great nation. I named you a good 10 reasons that you ought to get up on your feet and praise the Lord. Because he is awesome. Because he is all powerful. A doctor gave me a clean bill of health. Doctor said I'm good. I am healthy. Now, 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 do I got any people with arthritis that got a little praise in them? I'm serious. My grandma's hands hurt, and I cry sometimes. I know she's in such pain, but I look sometimes on Sunday morning when I'm back there preaching. I'll be there in two weeks, and they're singing, this is how we overcome. And I look, and my grandma up there with arthritis, her fingers are all, and she's just worshiping, and she's just praising. I, I'm not asking anybody, but is there, some, is there some of our pillars that say, you know what? I can't run anymore, I, but I got a little praise. Come on. Well, I'm not, will you step out and show these young people that, oh, I have aches and I have things that hurt, but I got praise. Somebody help me. Somebody help me. I'm asking. Come on. Come on. Come on. Help me. Will somebody come up here and say, you know what? I might not have everything I used to have financially, but I got a little praise left in me. I'm asking. Because if you can praise him when you're discouraged, he will come through for you. Your, your current situation is not your destination. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Come on. Young people, praise him. <laughs> 
Come on, you got a backslidden son. You got a back, you ought to be praising him. As you praise him, he is working for your family. Come on, take off your heaviness. Come on, take off your bad attitude and put on some praise. Come on, where are my people that are in a battle? You're in the battle. Come on, put your praise on. Your children, your marriage is struggling. Put your praise on. Put your praise on. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, real quick, real quick. Listen, listen. We're going to praise. We're going to praise. Now, this is... Mark Wall of Theology, but I think if you look in the Bible, I think you'll, you'll see that I believe this is truth. I believe we all, I believe there's angels. We're in a church that believes in supernatural. I believe there's angels. And I believe we all have angels that are looking over us. And, but do you notice why, why praise is so important? It's because I, I, you know, an angel's first job, way back, way back, way their first job, what do the angels do in the throne? They worship the Lord. So now, well, I believe we have angels that guard over us and watch over us. But I think when we praise the Lord, it lets them come from heaven because they're up there worshiping God. Okay? But when you praise the Lord, you give that angel an opportunity to work in your situation. Look, it's all over the Bible. They praise the Lord and miracles happen. Je that Jehoshaphat didn't just pray and fast, but he praised the Lord and the entire nation praised the Lord. So the angels are in heaven <laughs> worshiping. But when you, wor when you praise the Lord, and you worship him, you give that angel an opportunity to step out of heaven, to step into your situation and work a miracle. Do you need a miracle? Do you need a blessing? Do you, then you ought to praise the Lord. Come on, young, old, praise him with your hands, praise him with your mouth, praise him with your feet. Somebody praise the Lord.